Welcome to another episode of What's Working in E-Commerce. My name is Egan. I own an agency called Caravan Digital. We do paid search, paid social, and email marketing for e-commerce companies. And today I have Jamie Morales. He's from Seller Success Academy, and he has been in the e-commerce trenches a long time, and I'm really excited to talk to him. Jamie, welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. Tell us a little bit about your, you know, what you've done in e-commerce. It sounds like you've been doing this a long time. Did you say 1997? Yeah, so I started in 1997 on eBay, and I was just selling anything that I could actually profit from. And um, what came out of that was I was selling a few supplements, and I got I fell in love with consumables because customers were coming back. Um, unfortunately, onto eBay where I was paying them a cut of this sales. And I, because my background is in computer information systems, I built a website on the weekend. Um, back then, it was on Yahoo Store, and I threw those I threw those supplements in there, and it started to basically outpace the sales on eBay. And we ended up just expanding from there, just sourcing more products and adding it to our store. And just about anything we added. <laughs> actually took off because there wasn't as much competition you know amazon wasn't really selling you know anything but books back then maybe you know maybe vhs tapes i don't know <laughs> um but but yeah so that's kind of where i got my start and from there um we did a little bit of consulting on the side and such nothing big a few brick and mortar stores who wanted to get online some local businesses not even in e-commerce professional services and things so you know that was kind of like the journey the start of the journey for me we gave up ebay once our store started taking off and were you drop shipping other people's products then no, um, drop shipping wasn't really a thing back then. I was sourcing a lot of local inventory just from retail stores, and I guess you can call it arbitrage nowadays. You know, buying mostly computer parts because my background is in computers. You know, I'd buy a lot of computer parts, you know, back then scanners, video cards, you know, computer parts that were really popular. I was in the gaming machines, so I'd buy parts for those and just kind of resell them and flip them online. I was my hobbies were video games, sports cards, so I would buy those and flip those. But supplements were just kind of an accident. You know, I grew up in a family where my mom had always joined network marketing-based companies. And a lot of those revolved around supplement companies or consumables. And so I got used to, you know, just tagging along, you know, wherever my mom actually did her sales pitch, you know, for these opportunities and, and products associated with them. And I just thought I'd give it a shot and sell it online and it worked out. That's interesting. I like how you transferred some of those offline scales, sales skills into online then, huh? Very cool. Yeah. What was the traffic source like back then? How did you get people to the site? Well, you know, back then, we liked a lot of the tools. Um, there weren't really a lot of paid advertising platforms that were really king of the hill, you know, as, as they are now. We did a little bit of Google back then. You know, Yahoo was kind of trying to get it into that space also. But for the most part, it was just all the traditional old fashioned, you know, stuff like SEO was really big back then. As compared to now, I mean, it's big too, but I don't have a lot of clients that, you know, usually incorporate SEO into the business. But we also just use a lot of inserts, you know, and outgoing packages. We did a lot of mailers, you know, such as flyers or brochures about products. Um, and we also picked up, we weren't afraid to pick up the phone. <laughs> I mean, we made outgoing calls, whether that was cold calls or warm calls. You know, and, and I think that's a lost art. You know, a lot of those traditional marketing avenues that still work today. It's just everybody's wanting to automate everything, right? With all this technology and software. Pretty interesting. Is there something that comes to mind that you would learn from the network marketing model that you were able to apply to e-commerce? Yeah, to, to some extent, you, you know, even to this day, a lot of network marketing based companies still revolve around some sort of consumable line of product. And the tough part about consumables nowadays, especially if you're talking about any health related products, is not being able to you know, make any kind of outstanding claims that can get you in trouble with the FDA, right? Um, or the FTC even. Um, but, you know, if you can market them or if you can get creative in a way that doesn't get you in trouble, um, the great thing about, and, and we still do this today, is that if you're successful at it, you can generate recurring income or commissions, right? Not just from the sales and enrolling customers directly with the company, but also enrolling distributors. And the great thing about that is you enroll distributors and as they sell more product or recruit other distributors, not just domestically, but internationally, you know, you're earning a piece of that pie or those commissions from all 
all of their efforts. So instead of you operating as even if you're a solopreneur, you can have an army, you know, a worldwide army of somewhat kind of like affiliates that are doing some of the work for you and generating sales and building a network. And you're just getting checks that sometimes exceed your sales. <laughs> and so even to this day, after being in it for, you know, I've been in network marketing for two and a half decades. I mean, I earn checks randomly, like from some company that I don't even have to sell any products at all, you know, for, and all of a sudden, you know, here's a $25 check or a $5,000 check or a $200 check, you know, and it's, so yeah, it can be incorporated. And there's a lot more network marketing companies nowadays and over time that are, have nothing to do with consumables. You know, there's, there's all kinds of industries now or category of products that are out there. Pretty interesting. So are you seeing instead of affiliate marketing where someone else drives traffic to your site, in some cases you're partnering with people, they're a distributor, they're selling through their site or their channels and you supply the product? Yeah, you know, because what, what happens there and it, it's kind of like an upgraded or level up from an affiliate, right? Because an affiliate can sign up on anybody's site and not do anything, right? And, and it's, it's like you're pushing a noodle sometimes because there are a lot of, there's a lot of newbies in that space who think, oh, let's sign up for this affiliate program. I can make some money at home, you know, but when you enroll someone as a distributor into a network marketing based company, usually there's enrollment fees. There's a requirement to buy product normally um, or usually on a monthly recurring basis. And so they're a lot more invested, right? And not a lot of money. I mean, it's, I think the industry standard is like 2% of people make money in network marketing or something like that if they're really serious about it and they actually stick with it. But however, you know, when you do enroll a distributor, you're putting them in business. They're in a business, right? And so at that point, they're provided with tools, training, materials, the actual products to consume or use so they can test it themselves. So it's a lot more tangible than just signing up, getting approved for a link, and then uh, now what do you do with the link? Yeah, and I, I apologize if I'm missing this, but in modern parlance then, would someone else have a Shopify site and your products would be on it? Well, you know, so it's not my products, right? It would be a company, the network marketing company's products and business opportunity. And so I might retail the product. However, sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll get someone who's interested in reselling those same products or those lines, whether they know it's a network marketing based uh, company of line of products or not. And then that's when the conversation opens up to like, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, you can be a distributor for $50, you know, one time, and then all of a sudden you, you, got, you can buy products at wholesale, and then you can build your own website, or sometimes network marketing companies provide you a website either for a small fee or for free. Gotcha. Has this been a significant part of your business or just a piece of it? And you're doing a lot of other things too. I would say that no, it's, it's probably like 5% of my car business. But, you know, in terms of the focus on retailing the products, I would say it's about 5%. Commission wise, it fluctuates month to month in terms of what my network of distributors and what specific company, how much activity is going on there. Tell us a little bit about, you know, your core business right now or what's the main thing you're working on? Whew, I'm still trying to figure that out. You know, in 2016, I came out with an Amazon course and that's actually what Seller Success Academy was. It attracted a lot of new sellers. who just wanted to sell online, especially work from home. And, you know, Amazon, along with eBay and a few other marketplaces that we're in, such as like Walmart, Bonanza and Sears and Newegg and Rakuten. Um, so we're, we're called like a multi-channel or omni-channel, you know, e-commerce seller. I think it was back in, I mean, the beginning of eBay, but throughout probably closer to 2010, when we started to get really hooked in the third-party marketplace. So that kind of became the core of our business for probably the first half of my career. It wasn't until I got suspended on Amazon back in 2014 for something totally unrelated to anything that we did. It was more of an investigation into how some prescription drugs made it onto the Amazon platform that Amazon suspended thousands of sellers to conduct that invest investigation to weed out who the bad players for bad apples were, right? So back in 2014, we got reinstated, you know, shortly after that. And then in 2016, I decided that I would start an online course because my passion is in coaching and education. So I created this online course, attracted a lot of uh, people who were already following us on uh, social media because we did a lot of traveling and, and things like that. And we talked about our business a little bit here and there. So we attracted a lot of newbies who we kind of launched or helped launch on Amazon. And it was based on a wholesale model, you know, buying products wholesale and then reselling them for whatever profit you're left with, selling it on specific just Amazon platform, didn't require a website or anything like that, just an Amazon seller account. You know, that was primarily driven by, of course, my passion, but also to diversify, right? Because we were 99% Amazon. When I say 99%, like the bulk of the revenue was coming from Amazon, even though we had already been diversified through the other third party marketplaces. So the other third party marketplaces, we didn't really put a lot of effort into, like in marketing, and a lot of them didn't even have marketing platforms, you know, like Amazon already had like paid ads and things while everybody else was lagging behind. You know, they didn't even have an ad platform. So it's like you just list products and you take what you can get. And so that's kind of why that was the bulk of our business. But 
also because everybody in my company was trained to focus on where the money was, <laughs> you know, Amazon, right? So when we learned from that and launched the course, that became kind of like the testing ground for me to see how well I can transfer my knowledge or my, my wife and I are business partners. So she was a coach in it too. Transfer our knowledge to people who knew nothing about selling online or didn't even have much business experience. Um, and that went well. That was from 2016 towards probably like the third quarter of 2018. And we, we trained over 200 people uh, there. Later on, you know, we started to attract more experienced sellers and established sellers on Amazon also. So we started helping them. And then the business model or the, the environment on Amazon started to change. They become, became a lot stricter towards newer sellers. A lot of their policies become a lot tighter and stringent. And it, it was just starting to become a lot more complex to do business in that marketplace in general. So, you know, I wanted to reinvent the business model that I was teaching because the margins for wholesale were fairly thin at that point, depending upon what you were selling. And so I kind of exited, but I was also, you know, I just want to take a break really. So back in 2018, we bought, a, we bought an RV. We started traveling the country full time and we carried that adventure out for four straight years actually. <laughs> Um, from there. Actually, I think it was in 2018 that we were actually even coaching out of our RV while we were traveling the United States and even abroad. Um, so about three or four months out of the year, we would travel out of the country also. And so we continued teaching and such. 2018, we ended the program, shut down the website, and then just kind of manned our own you know, we went back into the trenches in our own business. So our business never really was shut down. It was always running. It was, we were always putting all our eggs into, you know, our own business, you know, this entire time, whether we were coaching someone or not. Then at that point, when I wanted to reinvent it, I kind of was like, well, you know, what am I going to reinvent it in? Because I don't really want to teach people how to build brands. There was enough people doing that. Um, and I didn't even have my brand myself, a brand of products necessarily. And so I thought, let's see what's really lacking in the market. You know, like I was trying to identify gaps in the e-commerce market. Uh, and so what emerged from that was me partnering up with brands. And what I found was obviously the options are you do it yourself or you hire someone in-house or you hire an agency to help you do whatever you need to do in e-commerce, right? What we did was because most of our experience was on Amazon and I was already rusty from e-commerce because our e-commerce site was doing seven figures a year easily for 15, 20 years. However, we started to neglect it once we transitioned and got addicted to third-party marketplaces, right? And so I started to get rusty because I wasn't doing SEO anymore. I wasn't doing a whole lot of email marketing, you know, um, and it was all focused on Amazon and it was concentrated around Amazon. And so what emerged from that was I ended up partnering up with brands. And I said, okay, if I knock on people's doors or if I message them or I call them, you know, most of them are going to deny me because they're going to be like, oh, you're just an Amazon seller or, you know, it doesn't matter what your expertise is. You know, we have enough Amazon sellers, you know, we don't need any more. And so what I ended up doing was I thought of an idea of, okay, if I were a brand and somebody approached me, what would I want? You know, and, and I think the thing that most brands want is even though they know it's not possible that to ask for a guarantee, you know, in some sense, that is kind of what they're looking for. It's kind of like if, if I take my risk on you and give you my business, you know, what's the risk level there? Right. And so my idea was let's remove that risk, you know, as much as possible. And so I ended up partnering up with them in the sense that I offered agency level services and I knew what it was worth. But beyond that, I would even invest my own dollars in exchange for representing their brand online if they would give me exclusivity so it didn't matter if it was exclusivity on amazon or online all i did was i approached them and said hey look i've got you know i still had 20 something years of experience when i started that right so i told them i got 20 years of experience and i tested this first with the brands that i had already represented the suppliers that I already represented so i approached them first and was like look i've been buying from you you know and you know i'm just one of your retailers right but in reality what are these other retailers doing for you but just buying wholesale too and then we're just splitting the sales you know wherever we're selling right we're all competing against each other and no one's incentivized to do anything more than just retail your products right so i said how about you give me like six months you know, and in six months, I would do some studies and, you know, analyze your business. And in six months then I triple your, your sales revenue, your profitability, you know, or whatever it is, that is the metric that they care about that I feel like I can actually improve upon. And you give me exclusivity for that six months. And I will invest my entire team's experience over so many years, plus an unlimited budget, really, as long as what I invest that budget is, is, is profitable to grow your brand, you know, and be an actual part of your company and care about, you know, what you care about versus you giving it to 10, 20 sellers online and no one cares because they're just trying to get a piece of the pie, right? And so we brought in, you know, some brands. And the first brand that we did that with was a brand that was actually, we actually was doing almost $20 million a year on three products. <laughs> and so 
But the advantage there and the con there was the fact that we had already been representing for 11 years. So there was already a lot that was invested by other sellers and brands that were kind of selling this product. We just kind of poured fuel on the fire by investing in the first year alone, $50,000 worth of paid advertising online. And so that just doubled the sales just like that. Um, and so we thought, okay, it's a fluke. It's somebody we were already doing business with and they were doing well. Let's, let's go take like a brand that's doing poorly online, but had potential, right? And so we found this one company that was uh, 25 years old, 25 plus year old uh, company that sold nut butters. And at best, they were doing about $6,000 a month in sales across about 28 SKUs. And so we did, we offered the same arrangement. And within three months, we got it to um, around fifteen twenty thousand dollars in sales. And in six months, we were hovering around the forty thousand dollars a month in um, sales revenue. And they weren't spending a dime on advertising on anything. We were actually even buying the product. So in that arrangement, we still buy the product for whatever they want to charge us wholesale. So in, in essence, we became, I guess, a hybrid of a of an agency and an investor in all of these other brands. And then today, now we, we've got close to 10 brands that we serve. Um, we don't need a lot because obviously if we rewind eight years ago, we had 45,000 products that we sold. Today we have 200, you know, so we don't need a lot because we're now exclusive for these brands. Therefore our margins are protected. We can sell it for whatever we want. Our margins are higher. We have control over what happens or what doesn't happen. That's one aspect of our business, not the core still actually. <laughs> But that's a huge part of our business today is serving brands. That's amazing. I, there's so many questions coming out of that. That's incredible. You guys can get those results. I want to know a little more of how do you vet a brand and you know they've got potential? You know, by being proactive, you know, I, I realize like off of Amazon, let's say that there are basically things you need access to, like Google Analytics, Google Ads accounts, the website backend, any kind of other reporting tools. Um, maybe speaking to the owner and questioning them in terms of like, what's your most profitable, what's your margins, you know, so on and so on. Um, in the Amazon world, there, there's a plethora of third party tools that because I was a seller first before I became that business model that I still had in my toolbox. I had tools that analyze just publicly what's available, you know, what the sales rank was, you know, in the, in the Amazon marketplace. Um, I could see just based upon when a product was listed, how long it's been listed in a marketplace, because usually that's public information too, like when it was listed on uh, a marketplace. Um, I have tools that show me the fluctuations in price. I have tools that show me how many sellers at any given time, you know, something had. You know, there's a lot of things I think you can garner off the surface proactively and at least make like a basic assessment that once you get to that, you have enough data. You know, I'm usually recording a video while I'm going through this analysis and that's my pitch when I first email someone or get in contact with them. It's not even something, well, hey, can we set up an appointment? I think there's an opportunity. No, it's kind of like I just, I send a video and I say, this is the opportunity and this is the level of risk, which is almost nil. Would you like to get on a call? <laughs> you know, at that point, because I'm quantifying the value or projecting for them what the value is. So they, they, they're not wondering, it's not like, man, if I spend an hour or half an hour on this call, this guy's just going to pitch me. It's kind of like, no, I'm already giving you the pitch in the video. It's like free money. I, I mean, quite frankly, the number one reason we get turned down is because what we have to offer in that business model is too hard to believe, right? It's like, we're taking all this risk and they're like, that's too good to be true. That's not even real, you know, forget that. So that's the number one reason, about the only reason we ever get denied, really, unless it's a huge brand that nobody can get their foot in the door. I don't go after huge brands. I go after small, maybe medium, but smaller brands are a lot more receptive. You tell them you can make them an extra $10,000 a month and they're like, okay, how, you know, where do we sign? That's the, that's the piece I want to understand. And so it sounds like you've got tools, you know, I come from the S SEO world. So we would use Ahrefs and SEMrush and things like that. It sounds like there's equivalents for that. I don't know, Jungle Scout or others, maybe for Amazon that yeah. you're looking at. And then you've got sort of data points you're looking at. Here's opportunity, maybe based on search volume or interest or things like that. And you say, ah, here's a promising brand. Is that right? Yeah. The biggest thing is, you know, it doesn't matter what marketplace we're talking about or if we're just talking about like websites in general. As an agency or a service provider, you got to be able to quantify the monetary or financial value of what you're pitching, right? Telling someone that you could rank 25 of their top keywords in the first page 
you know, I know some of those tools will give you kind of like an estimate of what that keyword is worth, right? But how do you relate that to their product, their specific brand and product? You know, that that's kind of tough. Like, I, I haven't really even gone that far to try to figure that out. Now, if I were going to go after an actual site off of Amazon and not a third party marketplace, you know, I would just start with, you know, what I'm very good at is I've got high attention to detail and I'm very observant. You know, I can go spend five minutes on a site and I can figure out all the holes that need to be filled like a bucket with, you know, that this is what I kind of describe it. It's kind of like, okay, you got a bucket of water and your paid traffic or whatever marketing you're doing is the, the water and you're pouring it into the bucket, but you've got all these holes. So you're never able to fill the bucket because it's leaking, right? And that's what I see in a website or that's what I see on Amazon. Or that's what I see on Walmart when it pertains to brands. All I got to figure out is how do I present it to the brand that I know how to plug up those holes with what and how much it's going to cost and then what it's going to produce once it's plugged up, right? And I'm not even necessarily claiming that I can plug up all those holes. I'm just saying, okay, you got 25 holes. Maybe I can plug up like 17, you know, you're still going to make out somehow, but I got to be able to quantify that. So I'm very kind of like methodical. I'm not quick to try to sign a ton of clients up or, you know, brands up, you know, one, like I said, could last you three, four, five years and never have to get into the brand again if you get the right one. Just so I understand that six month arrangement, then are you paying for the paid traffic or they're paying for that? Well, so here's what happens. When I make my pitch, normally it, I'm the one paying 